How did the Jay-Z beef start? <laughs> How did it all start? You gonna really get at me, or you gonna get at somebody on that level? If I was to get at somebody on that level, I gotta make sure I come with the best, my best. You guys don't want it with hope. X9, she don't want it with hope. No! It's not happening. There is no takeover. Ah. Fuck with your soul like ether. Yeah. We'll teach you the king, you know you. Nah. Dark side across the belly. Lose. I prove you lost the belly. Uh. yourself for the main event. What up guys, your boy Quake, and I'm finally back with brand new episodes of Who Really Won. This is officially the start of Season 2. There's nothing that's really going to change besides the fact that I've separated them into seasons. And we're, of course, we're going to kick this off with one of the biggest beefs in hip-hop history ever. But before we get into that, be sure to follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at QuakeGW. A link is in the description below for both. With the start of season two, of course, I had to start with a bang. This is an episode that has been requested so much ever since the series started, and rightfully so because this is easily in the top three when it comes to battles that happened in hip-hop because it featured two of the biggest hip-hop stars and still to this day, two legendary artists. And of course, as you can tell by the video title, I'm talking about Jay-Z versus Nas. When this battle started in the early 2000s, the whole world in the hip-hop community was paying attention to it. Who would make the right move? Who would have the better diss track? To compare it to today's time, it would be the equivalent to if Drake and Kendrick Lamar started beefing. It was basically them at their peak in that time, and this would be the equivalent to that if they did that. With this battle happening right after Tupac and Biggie had passed, the two biggest hip-hop stars, everyone was worried that this battle would escalate to something very violent, but thankfully that never happened, even though a lot of lines were crossed. This battle birthed arguably some of the best diss tracks ever with Jay-Z's takeover and Nas's ether. A lot of people still to this day debate on which track is better, but the most interesting thing about this battle is the origins of it and how it started. There were four key factors in how this battle started. I'm going to explore every single one. If you haven't seen previous episodes, then this is how we break it down into four different points. The first one being how the battle actually started, the second being the major points in the battle. Then I get into my opinion and talk about who won the battle portion of the beef, which is the short term portion of the beef in the midst of the battle who won. Then I talk about who won the war portion of the beef after the battle was settled, who had the the victory. So with that being said, grab a drink, grab some popcorn, sit back, relax, and let's get into this insane battle between Nas and Jay-Z. So if you were to ask Nas or Jay-Z, how did this battle actually start? What was the root of it? Both of them would say it's just rap competition. Neither of them would directly answer your question. Nas even mentioned so far to say that it was just subliminal disses back and forth, and then eventually it got to direct shots at each other. The question on everybody's mind, how did this get started with you and Jay? What, what, what's the problem? I think it's like, um, it's just hip hop. It's just, you know, right. people bump heads, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's always like, rappers always talking like um, subliminal met disses to each other. I think this one was a tension that was brewing in right. the streets of New York for a couple of years. Right. And, um, you know, it just came, came to life. No, it don't bother me. I mean, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? I just, I accept it. I accept the challenge. I, I think I can, um, you know, I can hold my own. You know what I'm saying? As far as that, as far as challenging, as far as in challenges, like rappers and sh you know things like that. That's well, fine. I'm cool with that. You know, rap is a competitive sport. That's how it was built. It was built um, in, in the South Bronx. You know, people battling outside. So, of course, as time goes on, the truth eventually comes out and the artist doesn't have to directly answer the question because 
people do their research, people ask other people that are close to those artists, and then we get the actual information. But a lot of the information is usually scattered, and on this one, there are four major points on how this battle even started. They all added up and led up to the situation where Jay-Z decided to go directly at Nas, and then it became public that Nas and Jay-Z do not like each other. The first initial seed that was planted on Jay-Z and Nas's relationship going bad goes way back to 1996 when Jay-Z was recording his debut album, Reasonable Doubt. Jay-Z released the first single off his album called Dead Presidents on February 20th, 1996. And this single was where the birth of the issues between Nas and Jay-Z apparently happened. On this single, the producer and Jay-Z decided to sample Nas's track the World Is Yours from his debut album Illmatic that dropped in 1994. Apparently when they sampled it, Jay-Z wanted Nas to re-record the chorus and make a newer version of it. When he got asked to do that, Nas declined and said he did not want to go to the studio to do that. And on top of that, Jay-Z asked Nas to be in the music video for the song and Nas declined that as well. And this is where Jay-Z started having bad feelings towards Nas because he felt disrespected. The first subliminal shot between the two started from Nas. Nas released his second album, It Was Written, on July 2nd, 1996, which is only a week after Jay-Z released his debut album, Reasonable Doubt. On the album, It Was Written, there was a track called The Message, and on this track, Nas decided to take a couple subliminal shots at a few hip-hop artists, including Jay-Z. On the track, Nas says, Lex with the TV sets the minimum. And this line was perceived to be shots at Jay-Z. But when Nas got interviewed about this line in 2016 by Complex, he simply said Jay-Z inspired that line. It wasn't a direct diss at Jay-Z, but people took it like that because he was dissing other artists on the same track. In the interview, Nas said, I saw Jay-Z driving a Lexus with the TVs in them. I got rid of my Lexus at that point, and I was looking for the next best thing. It wasn't a shot at Jay, but it was just saying that's the minimum you gotta have. It's not a shot at him, but he inspired that line. It wasn't necessarily a shot at him, but because the song was a shot at everybody, he fell into that, but he definitely inspired that line. In this quote, Nas said, the song was a shot at everybody. What does he mean when he says this? Well, this segues into the second part that escalated the battle between Nas versus Jay-Z, and what that was was the fight for the title of the King of New York. And this is where the competition part came in when it comes to this battle. And in hip hop, simply wanting to be the best is something that basically birthed hip hop. MCs were constantly battling back and forth. So that's the nature of hip hop in itself. But then also egos came along. Because if you remember at this time, a lot of newer New York rappers were coming into the picture. Jay-Z just released his debut album. Nas in 1994 released his debut album. And Biggie in 1994 released his debut album. So those three were kind of going at it for the title of the King of New York. But Biggie was the one that was winning that title by a long shot thanks to his commercial success. When Biggie dropped his debut album, Ready to Die, on September 13th, 1994, this was the same year that Nas dropped his debut album, Illmatic. But the difference between the two was that Biggie had an insane amount of commercial success thanks to the tracks Big Papa and Juicy. He was a household name by 1995, and the Source magazine in July crowned him the king of new york because on his debut album he would say constantly he is the king of new york and of course nas felt like he had the better debut album and he was upset that he didn't have as much commercial success as biggie did so on the second album on the track the message he decides to subliminally diss biggie in the track he says there's one life one love so there can only be one king let me let y'all niggas know one thing. There's one life, one love, so there can only be one king. 
and Nas later on went on to confirm that these bars were disses at Biggie and Biggie ended up responding. They went back and forth but then as we know in March of 1997 Biggie ended up passing away and when Biggie passed Jay-Z felt like the throne was there for the taking and decided to release more tracks on his second album basically saying that I'm the new king of New York and Nas took offense to this. So this is the second thing that escalated their battle. Who was the king of New York after Biggie passed? Nas and Jay-Z went at it subliminally back and forth. Jay-Z released his second album, In My Lifetime, Volume 1, on November 4th, 1997, which is about six, seven months after Biggie had passed. And on this album, he has a track called The City Is Mine. And as you could tell by the title, it's clear that Jay-Z after Biggie passed, feels like he's the king of New York now. He pays homage to Biggie in the track, but he also says, it's my crown for the taking now. I'm taking over the city. I'm the focal point like Biggie in his prime on the Lodo. The city is mine. Jay-Z on this album also made it clear that he knows that there was a debate between who's the best in New York, Biggie, Nas, or Jay-Z. On the track where I'm from, he makes reference to that. I'm from where niggas pull your car and all you all day about who's the best MCs, Biggie, Jay Z, and Nas. About a year and a half later, Nas releases his third studio album, I Am, on April 6th, 1999. And on the album, he has a track called We Will Survive. And on this track, he pays homage to Tupac and Biggie. And he also decides to take subliminal shots at Jay-Z for claiming to be the king of New York after Biggie had passed. It used to be fun making records to see your response, but now competition is none. Now that you're gone and these niggas is wrong, using your name in vain and they claim to be New York's king. It ain't about that. Now let's talk about the third thing that escalated this beef into something more serious. And this is something that we had no clue about because it was behind the scenes. We found out about this when the beef became public between Nas and Jay-Z in 2001. The third thing that was brewing behind the scenes was that Jay-Z decided to sleep with Nas's girlfriend at that time, Carmen Bryan, whom he had a kid with. Carmen mentioned that she had met Jay-Z roughly around the time after he dropped Reasonable Doubt, which was in June 1996. So later in 1996, presumably in November, December of that year, she met Jay-Z at a party. They hit it off. The next day, apparently, Nas and Carmen got into an argument, and Carmen decided to hit up Jay-Z, and that's how they started becoming closer and closer. And according to Carmen, she ended up getting pregnant by Jay-Z, but she had a miscarriage, so she never had a kid by Jay-Z. I met Jay-Z when... Right after he dropped Reasonable Doubt. Right. Reasonable Doubt was out like a minute because I remember like, oh, what's this? Who's this? Oh, I like this song. And then I met him through a friend at a party. And um, the next day, Naz and I got into like some big fight and he pissed me off. And so I just said, oh, let me call Jay-Z. Jay-Z knew that you had a daughter with Nas. Yes, he did. He okay. was aware of that. He was aware of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you guys are messing around. You and Nas are getting into problems, you know, are, mm -hmm. are having problems with your relationship. Yes. At one point, you were pregnant by Jay? Yes, I had a miscarriage. Uh, how far along were you? I, I believe I was definitely less than three months. It was the first okay. it trimester. Was still, yeah, it wasn't. It was still early. Exactly. Yeah, it wasn't anything okay. crazy. It wasn't planned. It wasn't like, oh, we're going to have this baby. And. You know, move forward with our relationship. No. Oh, okay. When you told Jay that you were pregnant, what was his reaction? I told him after the. Oh, you told him after. I told him after. The okay, fact. So he didn't even know. No, no, okay. I told him after the fact. This was something that was brewing behind the scenes over the years from 1996 till about 1999, and around 1999, she said that her and Jay Z were closer together. She wasn't with Nas anymore. They were just taking care of the kid back and forth. This is where a lot of people speculate that the beef got serious because, you know, you're dealing with kids here. You're dealing with people's emotions. So it can get very, very serious very, very quickly. So that's why it escalated to the point where it became public. Jay-Z even sent subliminal shots at Nas about his relationship with Nas's girlfriend at that time 
on the track is That Your Chick, which was Memphis Bleak's track, and it got released in September of 2000. She keep begging me to hit it raw. She, she got my kids and say it was yours. How foul is she? And you wiped up. Shit, I put the rubber on tighter. And this segues into the fourth reason this battle started, and that's all because of Jay-Z's artist, Memphis Bleak. Memphis Bleak believes he's the reason the beef initially started. Him and Nas were sending subliminal shots at each other on various tracks. However, Memphis Bleak was a huge fan of Nas. I started that drama, so what you mean how I feel about it? I felt like I got my big homie in some shit. It's going down out here in these New York streets. We gotta hold it down. Him being a fan of Nas is exactly what got him in trouble in the first place with Nas. When Nas released his third studio album, I Am, in April of 1999, he released a track on that album called Nas Is Like. Then in that same year, Memphis Bleak released his debut album in August, and his first single off his album is Memphis Bleak Is. And the song sounded similar to Nas's record, so Nas took offense to this, because as we all know, Jay-Z kept sampling Nas and then Jay-Z would send subliminal shots. Nas did not like that. He felt the same from Memphis Bleak. Also, there is a track on Memphis Bleak's debut album called What You Think Of That featuring Jay-Z. And on this track, Jay-Z makes reference to having the crown in hip hop. I'm a ball till I fall, what you think of that? Ground here front, like my shit don't sound like nothing. Like I ain't got the crown of sun. So Nas decides to subliminally respond to Jay-Z and Memphis Bleak with that track, What You Think of That. And just a couple months later, Nas releases his fourth studio album, Nostradamus. And on the title track, Nostradamus, which was released as the first single on October 26th, 1999, he makes reference to that What You Think of That hook and then asks for beef on that same song. You want a ball till you fall, I can help you with that. You want beef, I can let a slug melt in your hat. Memphis Bleak then says he was on vacation and a lot of people from his hood called him and referenced that Nostradamus track to him and told him that Nas was dissing him. And they called me, I was in the Bahamas and my homie hit me. He like, yo, Nas getting at you on this joint. So he played it for me over the phone. So niggas like, damn, Nas shitting on you. So I wrote mine right. Like, all right, cool. Getting at me, I'm gonna get at you. So then Memphis Bleak decides to release his new single, Mind Mind Right, a couple months later on March 2000 and decides to take more subliminal shots at Nas. Even though he didn't mention Nas's name on the track, he did mention Nas' second album, It Was Written, on the bars, so everyone knew he was talking about Nas. Written, so who you to be? Play your then a couple months passed again, and in the summer of 2000, DJ Clue dropped a new mixtape called The Great Ones Part 2, and on this mixtape, there was a freestyle from Nas spitting over the Mob Deep Eye for an Eye instrumental, and on this freestyle, he's taking more subliminal shots at Jay-Z. Your flow is one dimensional, your level is second grade, you on top, what? Copy and fuck, I said it first, you repeat it, your false crown covered in dirt, defeated, y'all niggas all hell, the king is dead, he running like a bitch with his tail between his legs, still mad and still eye for eye, wanna be God, you just the next rapper to die, fucking with Nas. Then a couple months pass once again, and in November of 21st, 2000, Nas and Illwill Records dropped the QB's Finest compilation album. And on the album, there was a track called The Bridge 2001, and Nas decides to attack everybody on Rockefeller, not just Memphis Bleak. He references the It Was Written line that Memphis Bleak spit on my mind right and decides to go at everybody. Oh, you didn't want to know whose life was written, the life I'm living, the ice, the women. Now, jaws is broke, your whole crew's coughing down, your whole, your man, lieutenant, your boss get found. And according to Memphis Bleak, after Jay-Z heard these bars on this track, this is when Jay-Z finally got involved in going at Nas and it officially became Nas versus Jay-Z. Another rumor as to why Jay-Z got involved in going at Nas was that Jay-Z heard Nas in a Los Angeles radio station talking shit about him and Memphis Bleak and so on and so forth. However, I checked the internet and I never found a clip of Nas talking shit about Jay-Z back in 2000 and in Los Angeles radio station. So that was just a rumor. I believe this story more than I believe the other one. Then on January 12th, 2001, 
Funk, Master Flex, and Jay Z linked up to do a long freestyle of the Rockefeller takeover on Hot 97, where Jay Z introduced all of his new artists he had signed at that time, from Memphis Bleak to Beanie Siegel to everyone else. And the reason why this freestyle was notable was because Jay Z had asked Funk Master Flex to just put on Queen's artist beats. And even though Jay Z did not spit in this freestyle, he was hyping up his artists that were spitting freestyles. And Nas, of course, took offense to this because Nas is from Queens and the fact that they were ripping only Queens artist beats talking shit on the freestyles and as we all know Jay-Z's from Brooklyn his some of his artists are from Philly so it was looked at as disrespectful this is when Mob Deep even got involved because they looked at it as disrespectful as well because they're from Queens too so it basically almost turned into a turf war just like Biggie versus Tupac did. Nas spoke on this on an interview done in December 2001 with Funk Master Flex. He talks about after they did those freestyles over those Queens artist beats, Jay-Z and Nas ran into each other at Steve Stout's party about a couple months after these freestyles. Nas ran up to Jay-Z, asked him, is there any issues between me and my camp versus you and your camp? Jay-Z said, no, nothing at all. And then Nas says is when Jay-Z went to Summer Jam and did that takeover thing. I paged the God. I said, because he's a black brother, we all gods. Straight mm -hmm. up. He is my brother. I paged him. I said, it's all fair and love and war. He pays me back and said, send a number. Mm -hmm. I paged back and said, you send a number. So he pays me back with a number to a studio. He wasn't there. Then he pays me with another number. I hit him and he said, yo, God, um... In no way was we up at Hot 97 disrespecting you. If we were, and I'm telling you this, I'm lying to you and I'm not a man. Jay knows he said this to me. Okay. I said, cool, bro. If you mean that much, then that means even if there was disrespect from any of his crew, he's taking it, he's taking the blame and said, Nas, my bad. So that was the end of it. We met at Stout Party again. I said, what up, dog? Yo, um, we had a good conversation. We smoking cigars and we chilling, my man. Um, everybody was there, the little girls from the hood, Shanita and everybody, my man, Lord, Bar Kim, everybody was there. We chilling. And um, I'm like, dog, you know the tension is brewing in New York City. And um, we can't do this because we don't know what the, the effects of it, that it would have the after effects. And he said, no doubt, you're right. And we had a good conversation. He also knew the marketing of it. So... I think it was inevitable for him to come at me as summer jam. However, it took about seven months for Jay-Z to say something publicly to Nas. And this is when he said it. As we all know, it was June 28th, 2001, Hot 97 Summer Jam. Jay-Z is the headliner. And well, he does something that is legendary. It's one of the most classic moments in hip-hop ever. And it's arguably one of the best moments ever. In summer jam history and on that day not only was jay-z the headliner but he decided to bring one of the biggest stars ever and that is michael jackson no hip-hop artist had done that at that time and to bring michael jackson to a hip-hop event like summer jam was iconic however that wasn't the thing that people were focusing on after his event was finished at summer jam it was the preview of the song the takeover which was a song responding to anybody that was talking shit about Jay-Z, and he was responding to any enemy he had. However, when he performed the takeover at the Summer Jam stage, the song wasn't completed, only the first two verses were done. And the first two verses, he was taking on any beef that anyone wanted with Jay-Z or Rockefeller, but in the second verse specifically, he decided to attack Prodigy of Mob Deep, and even put an old picture of Prodigy in a ballerina suit when he was a kid. However, after those two verses, towards the end of that second verse, he decides to call out Nas, and this is when officially the public knew Jay-Z and Nas had issues with each other. But like I said, this wasn't the finished product of the TakeOver song. The third verse, which was directly going at Nas, was not written. Jay-Z was basically testing the waters to see if Nas would take the bait, and Nas did exactly that. I don't care if you mob deep. I hold triggers to cruise. You little fuck, I got money stacks bigger than you. When I was pushing weight back in 88, you was a ballerina. I got the picture, I seen you. No, you not on my level. Get your brakes sweet. I sold what your whole album sold in my first week. Don't stop, Jay. Don't stop. Jay, you guys don't want it with hope. That's Nas. 
It only took Nas about a month to come back with a new freestyle responding to Jay-Z calling him out at the Summer Jam 2001 event. On August 1st, 2001, he decided to stop by Hot 97 and drop a freestyle for Funk Flex. And on this freestyle, he decided to go at everybody, including the people at Rockefeller, from Freeway to Beanie Siegel to Memphis Bleak. He decided to go at every single person and decided to name the freestyle H to the Omo, making fun of his song H to the Izzo. Rip the freeway, shoot through Memphis with money bags, stop in Philly, order cheese steaks and eat beans fast and bring it back up top, remove the fake king of New York, you show off, I count off when you sample my voice, I rule you, before you used to rap like the fool snickens, Nas design your blueprint, who you kidding, is he H to the Izzo, M to the Izzo, push Izzo, you phony, the rapper version of Cisco. And of course, Jay-Z heard this, and this is what fueled him to write the final two verses to his track, Takeover. And then when Jay-Z released his album, The Blueprint, on September 11th, 2001, we got the full version of TakeOver with those two new verses. And with those two new verses, he's going directly at Nas. And on the disc, he made it clear that even though he sampled Nas, Nas did not get paid from those samples. And on this track, he decided to threaten Nas that if he responded, he would reveal some information that nobody knew. And of course, now we know Jay-Z slept with Nas's ex. Went from nasty Nas to Esco's trash. Had a spark when you started, but now you're just garbage. You fell from top 10 to not mention at all. I showed you your first tech on Tour at Large yes. Professor. Then I heard your album about your tech on the dresser. So now, did you see the tech on tour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, he 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 has something. I won't I won't say he had it. No, he said he had a tech. He, Jay, yeah, 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 yeah. on himself. Yeah, no, nah, he 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 <laughs> had it. Oh yeah, I sampled your voice. You was using it wrong. You made it a hot line. I made it a hot song. And after this track dropped, everyone was siding with the Jay Z when it comes to this battle. Nobody thought Nas would come back with something better because at this time Nas was looked at someone. That was declining his music was apparently getting worse to a lot of people and jay-z was rising and getting better and better so a lot of people were counting nas out however nas was behind the scenes working on his new album stillmatic and a lot of people were expecting him to respond to takeover and that's exactly what nas did sometime in november of 2001 dj k slay was chilling at his house a couple people affiliated with nas came to him and presented him the ether disc track he said he listened to the track really loved it went crazy and that's when he put it on his mixtape and that song started flooding the streets when niggas came to my house uh I don't want to throw a nigga under the bus because a lot of niggas switch <laughs> yeah. switch up like yeah, Slade yeah, don't mention me but they said yo so I got cool. this record nigga killing Jay-Z I'm like man I don't know about that like this nigga seem untouchable you know what I'm saying? And then um, he said, nah, nah, I was just getting them, this and that. I threw the first uh, joint on first, and I'm like, okay, nigga said a little something. <laughs> yeah. Second verse came on, I'm like, third verse, I'm on my phone like, yo, niggas, <laughs> this joint right here might be it. Like, like um, I was ecstatic, like, yo, I ain't never heard a nigga really, you know what I'm saying, take their time and... Like you could tell Nas didn't waste a ball in that joint. Come out of my throne, I got this lock since 9-1. I am the truest. Name a rapper that I ain't influenced. Yeah. Rockefeller died of AIDS, that was the end of his chapter. And that's the guy I chose to name your company after. And Emilio Sparks actually talks about the time Jay-Z first heard Nas's ether. Apparently he was at a club. Some DJ played it the second he entered the club, which Jay-Z felt disrespected by. When you first heard Ether, where was you? At the club. It was ugly. Cause <laughs> <laughs> it was ugly. We was in like Cheetah or somewhere. Prime oh, you was time. in the city. Oh, you was in, in the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We was in New York, man. It was prime time. No lie, doggy diamond. It was prime time. They burnt it. So we look at, we look at home. We like, damn. Oh, bro. you was actually with Jay-Z? Yeah, we was at the club chilling. And they played it in the club while he was there? And they played it. Who was the DJ? Damn, he didn't get his ass whooped? I don't know either. I think soon we walked and that was the whole purpose of the DJ playing it. Cause like, the shit you know starts, saying? cause the shit I starts, fuck sure. Jay-Z. So no, you know it did, like, it did. So we in there like it threw us up, but that's why we was, that's why we was 
that's why we was like pit bulls. It's like, hold up, get to the studio. This yeah, yeah, can't yeah, happen yeah, like yeah, this. Yeah, it yeah. can't happen like this. Everyone knows the version of Ether that came out on Nas's album Stillmatic that was produced by Ron Browse. Apparently, though, there was a different version of Ether, the original version that Nas intended to release, but it was way too violent and too vulgar. Even Columbia Records at that time didn't want Nas to put that on his album. The original version of Ether was originally produced by Swizz Beats, and some of the lyrics of the song have leaked. Large Professor even mentioned that Nas spit some lyrics about Aaliyah's plane crash dissing Dame Dash because at the time Dame Dash really liked Aaliyah and was dating her and they were really close. No, I was dating with Swiss did the original Ether. When Swiss did the original Ether? Swiss did the original Ether. That's the one he originally oh. rhymed over. It was faster and it was just a lot, a lot more noisier. Little variations. You know, I, I'm sure you heard of, you know what I'm saying, the Dame Dash, Plane Crash, and all that, the shit the, with the rhymes and shit. No, it's like, actually. Sorry, Aaliyah. I'm sorry it was you in the plane crash. It should have been Jay and uh, uh, Dame Dash. Nas took those bars out because he felt it was too disrespectful. And looking back on it, it would have been something that would have probably gone too far. Who knows if that track would have been better than the one that came out right now. Steve Stout, who was close with Nas at that time, says that he heard the original version and felt that it was terrible and that he should redo it. And he even gave him the Ron Browse beat instead of the Swiss Beats one. He calls me in, the album is about to go to mastering, and I go to the studio, mm -hmm. and he plays me Ether. Mm -hmm. It's like 2 in the morning. And he uses that beat. Mm -hmm. Now, we weren't even speaking. So the fact that he even called me to the studio the night before mastering was because he wanted me to hear like, did I go too far? Is this fucked up? <laughs> <laughs> and I get there at 2 in the morning, and Jungle is on some, fuck stop, you know, fuck that, yo, stop, fuck you. Uh -huh. da, da, da. And I'm listening to this shit, and I'm like, I take off my, well, we staying here all night. Right. We got to fix this. This is a mess. Oh. This is a mess. Wow. If this shit comes out, your career is over. <sighs> and he made the record. Mm. But there was a version, there was a different version of it with the same beat that was terrible. It is also rumored that Nas performed the original version of Ether one week before the actual version that we know now came out. It was rumored he performed it at a club in Rochester, New York. However, when he did an interview and Flex asked him about this, he said he never performed Ether at all. Nobody knew what he was talking about when he spit those lines about Aaliyah and Dame Dash. A lot of people were confused and he says he wished he could have took that back. But there's rumors that said he officially performed the song. Nas denies and said he only spit those Aaliyah and Dame Dash lines. At the moment, when I had the show in Rochester, mm -hmm. the fans haven't heard Ether yet. Okay. So they wanted me to say something. I didn't want to say Ether. They didn't know it. Okay. So I had just thought of something on the spot. And I was mad. I, I didn't really want to say that. I said, rest in peace, Aaliyah, I love you. Instead of you in that plane crash, it should have been. But, you know, that's me speaking out of... At the moment. At the moment, and no disrespect, Aaliyah was a beautiful woman and a queen. So, obviously, I wasn't dissing her when I said, rest in peace, I love you. Because I did love her when she was living. Mm -hmm. As well as now. So... I mean, I, I definitely take that back. Now, if we had social media like in today's day, we probably would have got footage of that original version. There is rumors that the original version is still around. It's floating and it might leak eventually, but there's only lyrics that leaked about the song and there isn't the beat. There isn't any snippet of that song out on the internet anywhere. There is also a rumor that 50 Cent at that time in 2001 just got shut up and was close with Nas. He was even going to sign with Nas at one point but ended up not doing it. Apparently 50 Cent was in the studio with Nas when Nas recorded the original version of Ether. I saw this rumor on RevoltTVs.com website where they talked about rumors of what happened in Nas's career that was legendary and I came across this. I don't know how true this is, but Nas and 50 at the time were hanging out a lot. So there could be truth to this. I just thought it was an interesting rumor that kind of went around and I didn't know about it till now. So I thought I'd mention it and maybe some of you could link to something. Maybe 50 could talk about it in the future. Who knows? However, the original version of the lyrics that leaked out, Fat Joe was actually asked 
about the original version of Ether in 2001 before the song came out by an interview done on allhiphop.com. The interviewer asks Fat Joe, one thing that came up today, Nas apparently has a response to Jay-Z's takeover on his upcoming album, which implicates you and Big Pun and includes the lyrics, call yourself gangsta, but you were begging for pardon that night in Carbon. When Terror Squad flipped on your squadron, tried to front on their checks till Pun put a gun to your chest. Fat Joe responds saying, we gotta hear it, but damn, what a way to put me right in the middle of the beef, huh? We don't comment on that, that's old news. Like I said, all the negative energy, all that shit you can throw out the window. Nas is crazy. No question that we are allies with Nas Escobar. We love Nas. I also named my son after Nas. As far as him and Jay-Z, with the beef, that's their stuff. Until somebody tries to involve me in that shit, that's it. I ain't got no problem with the whole Rockefeller. It's well documented. Everybody keeps trying to get me to talk about this shit in every interview. Why don't they ask Jay-Z this stuff? I read his interviews. Nobody asks him. If you interview him, ask him. Apparently, Fadjo wasn't with it. He didn't want to get involved with this. And those bars that Nas spit on the original Ether apparently exposed that Terror Squad confronted Jay-Z about some money that they owed him. Big Pun put a gun to Jay-Z's chest and Jay-Z folded and was scared. That's the apparent rumor from those bars. Fat Joe never confirmed it or denied it. Cuban Link, who was an artist on Terror Squad, was actually there when Fat Joe and Big Pun had that issue with Jay-Z. When he did an interview with This Is 50 back in 2011, he talked about the situation. The Rockefeller shit, yeah, it was a little shit that popped off, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it was uh, really um, some business uh, uh, negotiations that went sour. Jay-Z was supposed to perform for 15 Gs or something like that. It was like, you know, some street niggas that, that we knew that hired him. So yeah. he welched on his shit like he didn't really go and perform. Mm -hmm. He just showed up. And, and I heard that you know there was a meeting with, um, it was at Jay whatever, had a meeting with Fat Joe and Big Pun at the time. Oh, yeah. And they came oh, strapped gosh. up and then Jay had the little kids in the building just so uh, niggas wouldn't air it out. Wow, that was smart. All I remember <laughs> was Jay-Z doing the Matrix in the room oh, <laughs> by the couch mm. and pun chasing him. Wow! Pun chase Jay-Z. And Joe talking shit. Wow. Mm. So uh, the pressure was definitely put on. Nas confirmed that there was three versions of Ether in the promo run that he was doing with Stillmatic. He said the first version was very soft. He wasn't really going crazy at Jay-Z or anybody. Then the second version was way too hard. Apparently, Columbia Records didn't want that version coming out. And then the third version is the one that we hear now on the album. What's that? I heard that when you first went in the studio to do Ether, yeah. it was totally not like what it what, what the finished product was. Yeah, it was it was it was crazy, man. It was it was it was I won't say timid, but it was not really as direct. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, nah, we went through different stages of it. It was like I, I I was trying to be light about it. I didn't really want to come hard like that. And then I changed it, and it was too hard. So right. we had to cut it right and make it, like, just nice and classy. Now, that know? was your crew telling you, no, you gotta, it's got to be in the pocket. Yeah, I had some people, like, dig into them more. And right. I had some people like, nah, you can't say that, those things. Don't say these other things that I had cut out the record. Right. And, I, you know, I like where it's at now. P.D. Crack, who was once signed to Rockefeller, says that when Ether came out, the whole Rockefeller staff was in shambles. Dame Dash was really upset because he got dissed on the track, and overall, the energy was very different. I felt as though that after the Ether, when the Ether hit, that uh, it was the first time I seen Jay or just seen the, the crew up there looking vulnerable a little bit. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? looking kind of uneasy, you know what I mean? Because they look so confident and strong all of the time. It was just awkward to see Dame uh, seem under pressure a little bit. You know what I'm saying? That was just weird. Like, he had a meeting with us one time. Like, like yo, like, yo, man, yo, y'all still hear what the fuck? Y'all hear this shit? What's going on? Because, you know, Nas nah, hitting with this. Dame Diddy, Dame Daddy, a Dame Dummy. Threw him all in there, so he's defected. And then he went in on Jay and all that, so... Dane was like, yo, talking to us like in a huddle, like, like, like football, like, yo, you gotta get this nigga, y'all. Fuck that. <laughs> He's like sick of niggas, like, yo, yo, load up, run, go in on this nigga, fuck it. 
Now, after Ether was premiered by DJK Slay and was all over the streets in late November of 2001, a lot of people's memory is very foggy and tend to forget that Jay-Z actually responded to Ether with three tracks and not just with Super Ugly. Nas even highlights this in his interview that he did in December 19th, 2001. After I put out Ether, Jay made two records, ladies and gentlemen. He made two records. One was so garbage that it played for one night and never played again and nobody ever talked about it. He called himself European J. He called himself a European in the beginning of the record. Correct. And that's very correct. Then he put out the super ugly joint. What is that? Then I hear a record the people are talking where he's saying my rhymes like Judas and your arms too short the box. Uh. And then he wants to drop the album the same day as me. The first diss track that dropped that went over people's heads was a track called People Talking. This was the last track featured on Jay-Z's MTV Unplugged 2001 album that came out the same day as Nas's Stillmatic album in December 18th, 2001. Now, this is a track that went over people's heads, but it did not go over Nas's head. He knew he was getting shots from Jay-Z subliminally on this track. However, people seem to forget about this track because if you check out the Jay-Z MTV Unplugged album, that track is nowhere on there anymore. The track has gone missing from that album. The only way I got it was from a mixtape that was released in November 2001. Don't you know? When you defeat it, won't you throw? Throw in the towel, I'm better with vowels. I'm a man of principle, damn near invincible. Damn it, man, this is a gift from God. This ain't happy stand, so your arms are too short to box. Plus, we knuckle up unorthodox. Fast forward to December 11th, 2001, and as we all know, Jay-Z stopped by Hot 97 and spoke with Angie Martinez, and this is the day that he released two freestyle tracks going at Nas. The first one was called Don't You Know. This track was a direct shot at Nas. It was only played once on Hot 97 and then never played again. This is something that Nas mentions in his interview. He says he released a whack freestyle. It got swept under the rug because apparently the response was negative to it and it never got played again. However, this is what happened with this track. If you search up the Don't You Know track, you'll see that it's part of the 2002 Paid in Full soundtrack. However, this version wasn't the version that was played on the radio station that night. The version that's on the soundtrack had the first verse removed. The first verse was directly taking shots at Nas. Jay-Z even mentioned Nas's name in the freestyle. But because of the negative reaction when it was played on radio, that diss was swept under the rug and we never heard it again. But of course, as the internet goes, eventually things leak. But the quality of that leak was bad. I managed to find a better quality so you guys can actually hear it. And Just Blaze was interviewed about this track and he spoke on why it got removed from being a diss track and why that first verse was removed entirely from the soundtrack. He did an interview with Complex back in 2011 and said, Originally, that was a Nas diss record. The version that came out was not the one that was originally done. If I'm not mistaken, he recorded the Nas diss version, sent it to Funkmaster Flex, and then it went away. I want to say Flex played it in one time, and that was it. Then we changed it around. There was still subtle diss shots at Nas, but it wasn't a Nas diss record anymore. They needed the record from Jay for the Paid in Full soundtrack, and Jay kind of wanted that to be his Who Shot Ya. It wasn't for an album. Remember, originally Who Shot Ya wasn't on Ready to Die. They put it on there when they remastered it. He just wanted to have a dope record that was just for the streets. We had the record laying around for a while and decided to use it for Paid in Full. After that, of course, came Super Ugly, and this was the most disrespectful track from Jay-Z. He's talking about smashing Nas's ex and skeeting off in the back seat while their child is in there and it just took things to a different level. This is where a lot of people thought, you know, it would turn into violence because of how disrespectful this track was. Jay-Z even got Allen Iverson involved into this saying that Allen Iverson smashed Nas's ex as well. If it was on like that, I would come through Queens with Queens niggas. You know how I do. 
Look, I got more shooters in Queensbridge than you. Me and the boy A, I got more in common than just balling and rhyming. Get it? More in common. I came in your belly back seat, skeeted in your Jeep, left condoms on your baby seat. Here, yeah, nigga, the gloves is all, the love is done. It's whatever, whenever, however, nigga. And since you infatuated with saying that gay shit, guess you was kissing my dick when you was kissing that bitch. After this freestyle premiered, Angie Martinez and Hot 97 asked the fans who actually won this beef based on these two tracks. And Nas ended up winning the voting percentage with 58% of the votes and Jay-Z got 42% of the votes. So according to New York, it was a unanimous decision that Nas won this battle at this time. The next day, Jay-Z went to Hot 97 once again. And a lot of people were expecting him to release another diss track because of what happened with the voting. Nas clearly won the battle according to New Yorkers. However, Jay-Z did the exact opposite. He actually went up there to apologize to Nas after releasing the Super Ugly diss track. He said the reason he's apologizing was because his mom was listening to the radio station last night when he performed Super Ugly and said it was very distasteful and that he should apologize to Nas and his family and that he should have never brought Nas's ex and kids into this situation. The crazy thing is, is I couldn't find a single clip of Jay-Z when he went up to Hot 97 and premiered Super Ugly or even when he apologized to Nas. There is only a 30 second clip online where Jay-Z responds to Ether and gives his thoughts on the track. If you weren't you, would you think Ether was a hot joint? Um, I would be a little, like like me as a guy, like I would listen to the last verse and be like, wow. Like, dude, it's, wow. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it just, like, it's uneasy. Mm-hmm. You know? Okay. Like, I mean, even like, like, with the, it's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's far, man. It's very vulgar, you okay. know what I'm saying? Can we talk about Summer Jam for a second? Yeah. <laughs> what the hell was that? Angel Martinez says when she interviewed Jay-Z, this is when she felt like Jay-Z was defeated. He wasn't his normal, confident self in the interview. However, I did find articles that wrote about this interview when it happened and a bunch of quotes of what Jay-Z said when the interview was going on. Apparently, he said, Mom put in a call and said, that went too far and she's never ever called me about music. So I was like, okay, okay, I'll go shut it down. Jay-Z told Angie Martinez, who earlier in the week premiered Super Ugly on her show. However, Jigga did not take sole responsibility for the issue, instead saying that he wished he hadn't stooped to the level of his competition by bringing the mother of Nas's child into it. He said, once again, I apologize. I felt like I didn't think about women's feelings or Nas's girlfriend's feelings or even my mom. It was really like, let me meet your level of disrespect with this level of disrespect. Jay-Z also said that he figured that the track as an answer to Nas's ether would get plenty of airtime on local mixtapes, but he never expected it to get heavy rotation on radio. He said, freestyles usually go away in two weeks. I didn't know it was going to be the official battle of Beats, seven hour marathon. It was just an answer to disrespect. I didn't go in the studio to make a song. I made a two minute freestyle. The following week, Nas decided to stop by Hot 97 and talk to Funk Master Flex about Jay-Z's diss tracks, about Jay-Z apologizing, what he thought of those things, and if he felt like he won. And this was the day after Nas's Stillmatic came out, which was December 19th. 2001 and the album ended up debuting at number eight on the billboard 200 and sold about 342,000 copies within the first week and the reviews on it were amazing a lot of people liked it it was rarely any negative reviews and a lot of people felt like Nas was finally back everything i said come to light Y'all, de y'all deal with emotions like women. Mm -hmm. I said, you always making songs dissing women. I said, you pop-ish apologize later. Everything I said was dealing with reality, science. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, well, you know he got his name from jazz. Well, it, it's, it's at 97, uh, blazing no about Nas. Exactly. I, uh, but my question I was getting to, I mean, he said that... When this he, is all when, love. When, when so this is all love and... and when Jay-Z is here with, with, with Angie, he, he was expressing that, you know, that his mom called him and spoke on the situation and then everything concerning women and, and, and bringing up Carmen's name and, and how that wasn't a good flow. And I want to know how you guys jungle, yeah. Nas, how you guys yeah. feel about that. Any but at, at, at the same time, I can also, though, respect where a parent would come in. That's real. But you don't supposed to admit it. 
You don't mean, however, let that know. You're not supposed to let nobody know that. Yeah, but bust this out. I can also respect whatever. You know, when Mama Love comes into the play, that's the end. It's a rap. You can't. It's, you know what I'm saying? That's 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 the rap show. So you respected that? I respect that. All right. You know, I respect that. After this, there was no more direct shots at each other on tracks. A lot of the beef had died down. Nas was focusing on something more personal in his life. His mom was battling cancer, and his mom ended up passing away in April of 2002. So he was going through his own personal problems. Jay-Z was working on his next album and was working on building Rockefeller into a bigger brand and helping his current artists. So none of the artists were focused on the battle anymore, but the subliminal shots and tracks did not stop. It was announced in May of 2002 that Nas was going to headline the upcoming Hot 97 Summer Jam show. As we know, last year, Jay-Z was the headliner and decided to go at Nas directly and Mob Deep and went at everybody else. Now, it was Nas's turn to be the headliner. And of course, rumors started to come up about Nas reigniting the battle between Jay-Z at the Summer Jam show. Well, June 26, 2002 came and Nas was nowhere to be found at Summer Jam. And of course, Nas got backlash for not performing there fans were really upset hot 97 said they had nothing to do with Nas not showing up so of course Nas had to go on radio stations and clear up all these rumors the funny thing is that same night that he didn't perform he actually went to a radio station and clarified why he wasn't performing that night and the radio station that he went to was the rival radio station of hot 97 which was power 105 my people know why I'm not at the summer jam. I've been bamboozled, hoodwinked, and the whole nine, man. I was told and begged to do the summer jam. I was begged to come to Hot 97 because I had a hot new record that nobody wanted to support except for the streets. And um, and, and it was told to come there and save Angie Martinez's job. And I was told to come there and help the ratings at Hot 97 by Flex, you know, and the, and the rest of the crew over there But um, I'm, I'm here to let my people know mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying All my hip hop community people know That I was dissed this morning By Hot 97 And told that what I couldn't do on the show Which is really Is, is really outrageous And really shows that the wrong people are in power you know, his hip-hop thing comes from the streets. We need our freedom. If y'all if y'all ain't going to go for this fight for y'all freedom, y'all going to be like them sucker artists that just go up to the radio station and kiss ASS just to get some airtime or just suck flex or suck clue in them, trying to get on their best side so they can play your record. I'm going to tell Nas, me, myself, what I cannot do on a Summer Jam stage when it's been done. The same acts have been done. Four or five years in a row. Four or five years in a row, and last year it happened to be the diss was toward me by Jay, and he was all high and mighty. Right. Then I dropped the ether napalm bomb, and the whole crew was running like roaches, and now you got this station over there crying because he lost. Unanimous decision he lost, <laughs> and um, they played his records like he was dead, like it was a Jay-Z memorial. You know, not saying he was. Don't get me wrong, y'all. Not wishing that on any man, and that's my brother, but I'm saying... You're just looking for a, play, a fair play. A fair play. Field, play and and, it, and it's really out of hand, y'all. I'm not going for it. Then the next day, Angie Martinez and Sonny from Hot 97 responded to what Nas said. They said the only problem that the station had with Nas's performance was a planned mock lynching he wanted to do with Jay-Z. Angie Martinez explained management told him not to do it. Nas then decided if he couldn't do that portion of the show, he didn't want to do any of the show. We were not trying to protect a specific artist. This was not about politics, money, nothing. This was just a decision made, and that's the truth. Then on the same day, Wendy Williams decided to air her interview with Nas, and Nas said, they don't even know what I was about to do. It wasn't even Jay I was coming after. I can't even divulge everything I was going to do on that stage that was going to raise the bar of hip-hop music. So around this time, Nas was denying that he was going to lynch Jay-Z at his Summer Jam show. And as we all know, later on, Nas admitted that he was going to lynch Jay-Z at the Summer Jam show. And even footage came out 10 years later in 2012 of the designing of Jay-Z and how he's going to look when he's going to get lynched. Nas was asked about this in 2012 and he denied to comment on it. Hi, I'm Michael Burnett, special makeup effects artist, working on an effect for Nas. Um, this is Jay-Z, one of Nas's close friends. 
we're going to hang. And since Jay-Z wouldn't really let us hang him, we've made this. This is the silicone head. This is the skin that's gonna go on our animatronic figure. I don't know if, you, if you've been online today, some surface online, um, the video obviously, you and Jay has been talked about, the Summer Jam, what you plan to do. There was a almost like a documentary that came out online. I don't know if you've seen about the making of this stunt. I, I just heard about that today. Like, like, how does that make you feel? If it's 10 years later, how does that surface and how does that make you feel? Like, why does that surface 10 years later? I, I, I really don't want to even acknowledge it, man. It's, it's like everybody's in a different place. You know what I'm saying? I don't even want to acknowledge it. I'm, 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 I can't acknowledge that. As we all know, in 2002, Jay-Z and R. Kelly released their collab album, The Best of Both Worlds, in March of 2002. So on the Wendy Williams show, when Nas was doing that interview in June 27th of 2002, he called out Jay-Z for working with R. Kelly because around this time, the R. Kelly sex tape leaked of him peeing on an underage woman. So Nas called out Jay-Z for working with R. Kelly and says that he knows exactly what's going on with R. Kelly and the fact that he's touching up on underage women and having sex with them. I know he was, I could have showed the R. Kelly video that everybody's talking about, made fun of it, and showed you know, Jay's hanging out. You and Jay and I was in there doing best of both worlds. You can't tell me Jay didn't see a 14 year old girl come in the studio and shit on R. Kelly's lap. No. <laughs> you can't tell me, you want to sit here and tell me that you're working on that album, that he ain't never seen a 14 year old girl come in the vicinity? My, my belief is that anybody who's worked with him and been in his cypher has seen it go down. You've seen it go down. Yeah. Man, I've been around R. Kelly and I pay for that, brother. I've, I've been on a tour with him. It didn't last too long, but I, I've been around him. I, I, I didn't see no 14 year old, but I talked to the man and I've seen there's a little problem there. The brother needs help and I pay for him. But if I sit there and did an album about women with him, I'm definitely maybe indulging. You, you, he had to be indulgent for 14 year old, man. That's what I'm saying. What I'm here, I'm, I'm here for the people, man. I'm here to talk the truth. In that same Wendy Williams interview, Nas accused Flex of taking money under the table to play records. And he basically put a bounty on Flex's head and said, if you're a real man, take Flex's chain and give it to me. If you're a real man, when you see Flex, take off his chain and I got something for you. If you're a rap artist, that's real smack that guy, man. The following day on June 28, 2002, Nas decided to go back up to Power 105, and this time he didn't hold anything back. He decided to respond to Funkmaster Flex and Angie Martinez's comments of wanting to lynch Jay-Z. He decided to go in on Cameron and said his music is whack, he needs to step his bars up, and this is when the battle between Cameron and Nas started. He decided to go in on Nelly and said he's whack for going at KRS-One, and then he said a bunch of this stuff is just politics, and you need to pay your way into getting into these battles, into getting into these shows and to getting radio play he just went off completely at everyone i don't want to hear the radio disc jockey making records that's terrible i want to hear Whoa. true hip-hop music man oh. no nah, for real man i mean you know this I is mean, real man i mean I'm you guys no. gotta realize i ate it they had a takeover show and that was the song ladies and gentlemen the whack record jay had trying to come at me they named the whole show on that station a takeover and i ate that they don't worry about my feelings. They ain't worry about my feelings when he made a record dissing my daughter's mother with derogatory things about women. In Two his, records. Just, yeah, Two Jay, records. Jay just making records about how much he hates women, which is really makes me curious. You know what I'm saying? And I'm sitting here, and they just support that and support everything he does. But when Nas, God's son, answers him back, they team up with the evil. I buy pe these people albums, you know what I'm saying? And, and they ain't talking about nothing from Cam to everybody. I mean, I like Cam and everything. He's a good lyricist. But the album's whack, man. You know what I'm saying? Y'all brothers got to start rapping about something that's real, man. You know what I'm saying? My about man, Nori, life, man. I love you, Nori. Step your rap game up, man. I'm tired of... Nelly, you trying to battle KRS-One? Don't follow Nas, man. You can follow Nas if you're going to be creative, man. And that weekend, he did another interview and this time he clarified what he meant by putting a bounty on Funkmaster Flex's head. He says he regrets saying that because Flex is not built like that. Flex used to DJ at gay clubs. All kinds of stuff going at Angie Martinez once again. Going at Cameron and explain why he went at Cameron. Same with Nelly and so on and so forth. I brought up names. I brought up names like, um, you know, Cam, Nelly. Cameron because he had a hot single. The album to me is garbage, and that's how I feel. You know, rappers are scared to talk about these things, and the radio stations get paid to play these records over and over. The album's garbage. I'm saying step up your pen game. 
Noriega. I like Nori, you know what I'm saying? But I feel like he's really not taking this game serious enough. He's more talented than that. Who am I to decide? Who am I to say something? I'm a human being with opinion. Nelly, he made remarks about KRS-One. To me, it's outrageous. I don't know why I'm saying this. I don't know why what's got into me. But one thing is I love the music too much and I try to stay real to it. When I see people faking the funk, I can't have it. I bought, I, I bought Nelly album, I bought Nori album. Nelly's very talented, but just the battle between him and KRS-One, I ain't understand and I spoke, I spoke about it. No direction, the radio station, Angie Martinez makes records and really disgraces hip hop music. Flex is on the air with a nat, his voice is nasty. He's taking money on the table. What about, what about Flex, man? You, put, you kind of put a, a bounty on on his neck. All right, you know, I, I didn't mean that because as a real man, I'm not going to promote any violence. I'm not going to, you know, ask for any harm to be done to Flex. So, you know, I was outraged. I was angry. And I'm mad enough to say I really don't want nothing to happen to him because he's not fit for it. He's not built for it. He's not made for it. He's just a mouth that gets paid to do whatever he want to do. You know what I'm saying? He, from my understanding, he was mixing in gay clubs. Now he's mixing on Hot 97. Well, you know, to each his own, but what I'm saying is he's not built to be in that posi position, so I take that statement back. Then about a month later, on August 7, 2002, Jay-Z stopped by Hot 97 to talk with Angie Martinez. He took over the whole show for two days straight. He responded to Nas's comments and decided to challenge him to a pay-per-view boxing match. Um, Nas being on radio telling people to snatch somebody's chain, that's what you're taking outside of rap music because how about somebody don't want their chain snatched? Nas nah, gonna pay your um, Nas nah, gonna pay the bail. You know, if, mm -hmm. say the cops catch you. Let's you just say like a guy it. really don't want his chain snatched and something really happens to you. You know what I'm saying? And then is he gonna, is he gonna pay for the funeral? Is he gonna, um, what is he gonna tell your mom? Is he gonna go, you know, is he gonna have a sit down with your mom? So, but other than that, it's just rap music. Like it's, it's, it is, it's, it's wrestling. Um, Don't you know, he do a show. Nah, it's a show. Yeah, I do a show. Mm -hmm. Same place. Same place. We do. We get three. You know, we end it off. He get three uh, freestyles, as we call them. But you know, they're gonna be prepared. You know, three. <laughs> I prepared three. I got like fifty. Mm -hmm. We prepared three. And we just do it, like we put up some money, I put up a million, we put up a million. We keep that money, but all the pay-per-view money and all the money, all the proceeds that come from the pay-per-view and the people come in the building, we just get out the charity. Oh my We pick a couple of them. I love this. That should generate, that should generate a couple million now. Then a week later on August 14, 2002, Nas took word of that challenge and he told MTV, Pay-per-view is for wrestlers and boxers. I make records. If Jay-Z wants a battle, he should drop his album the same day I do and let the people decide. Nas then said he would be dropping his sixth album, God's Son, on November 19th. Unfortunately, the album got pushed back and they never did that album sales battle. Then the subliminal diss tracks started coming once again. On October 29th, 2002, the 8 Mile soundtrack came out. And track number 10 is Nas's You Wanna Be Me. And on this track, he's subliminally dissing Jay-Z. Realize how many classics I gave you. Perhaps if you think back, you'll realize that I made you. Then Jay-Z dropped his new album, Blueprint 2, The Gift and the Curse, on November 12th, 2002. And on the title track, he's sending subliminal shots at Nas. I'm back for you, had a chance to miss me. My mama can't say you this time, niggas, it's history. Then Nas drops his new album, Godson, about a month later on December 13th, 2002. And on the track, Last Real Guy Alive, he talks about the battle with Jay-Z and what he could have done differently. And he says Jay-Z was kicking him while he was down because he was caring for his mom. So when Jay-Z went at him on Summer Jam, he couldn't really even focus on the battle. I gave it all up so I could chill at home with mama. She was getting old and sick, so I stayed beside her. In the middle of that day, tried to sneak attack, assassinate my character, degrade my hood. Nas wasn't gonna make no diss record back. We had to force Nas to do that, man. I remember pulling up one day, Nas was driving in front of me. I was behind him, I jumped out of my car, got in his car, and left my car in the street, in the city of Manhattan. Keys in the ignition, door open and everything. Got in his car yelling, yo, we gotta get this dude. Also, another track on God's Son was Made You Look, and on this track, Nas was responding 
to Jay-Z's pay-per-view battle bout and said that he's going to send shots his way. Now we are in 2003 and for the most part this battle has died down. The only subliminal shots sent was when Jay-Z decided to promote his Black album and he went on BT's Rap City and spit a freestyle slightly going at Nas. They shoot and nobody dying. Somebody better put somebody body on somebody eye and sometime soon is somebody lying. I ain't buying that job shovelin. I ain't ducking for nothing, cousin. I'm too tall to act small, you liars. Then Nas sent some more subliminal shots at Jay-Z on the Braveheart single Quick to Back Down, which was released in December of 2003. First of all, this is Nas, I'm a brave heart, better brave heart. And those were the final subliminal shots sent at each other. As we know, in 2003, Jay-Z decided to retire with the Black Album, and Nas was just focusing on his career, and they stayed away from each other's paths. Then we fast forward to October 27th, 2005. Jay-Z announces he's headlining Power 105's Powerhouse Concert and decided to name his headlining concert I Declare War and Jay-Z said that he's going to air out some rappers on stage of course a lot of people thought you know he's going to start dissing more rappers and it would end up becoming something worse but what Jay-Z actually did was end the beef of any rappers that he had with and on this stage he decided to bring out Nas so the two performed Dead Presidents and The World Is Yours and the crowd was going absolutely nuts because they thought they never see these two come together. Me and him hadn't spoken. We saw each other in places, but there was no conversation, no dialogue. And um, L.A. Reid, who was then the man at Def Jam, he said, would you be willing to talk to Jay? And then, you know, this thing is old by now. I'm like, yeah. We went down to the studio, man. We just dapped each other up, started laughing. And the first thing Jay said to me, man, yo, you all right? And I guess he heard about my mom passing and beyond everything else, he looked at me and said, yo, man, you all right, man? And I, I said, yo, this is, this is a beautiful start right here. This is for our culture. This is for hip hop. We love y'all. Fast forward to January of 2006 and Nas decides to leave Columbia Records, the label he's been with since the start of his career, and decides to sign to Def Jam. The crazy thing about this was that Jay-Z became the president of Def Jam in late 2004. So Nas and Jay-Z now were under the same label and Jay-Z was the president, Nas was the artist, and it looked like these two became a lot closer and it was crazy to see. Then Nas and Jay-Z sat down together for an interview with MTV in 2006 to talk about their battle, to talk about how they became friends again and everything in between. The streets is watching, they're definitely talking. Why here and why now? It's bigger than both of us because it's not really about us. I mean, it is, but it really isn't. You know what I'm saying? It's more so about the, the culture and also about the ending and also about showing people another way. Because what we staged was something just stopped the world for a second. But it was always respect. It wasn't a point where, you know, he wanted to gun me down. I wanted to gun him. It was never that, you know, because that's not how I think how real bosses move or how real men move. Then on December 19th, 2006, Nas dropped his new album, Hip Hop Is Dead, and for the first time ever, Nas and Jay-Z officially collaborated on the track Black Republican. Then the following year, Jay-Z dropped American Gangster, and they would collaborate once again on the track Success, and so on and so forth. They made a lot of tracks together as time went on. They performed together multiple times at Coachella in 2014, and just recently in April of 2019, they performed once again together. That's it for their battle. Now let's get into the opinion side of this where I talk about who won the battle portion of the beef, which is the short term portion of the beef in the midst of the battle, who won. And then I talk about who won the war portion, which is after the battle settled, who had better longevity, who had a better career. For the battle portion, I give this one to Nas and here's why. The debate for the most part is about takeover versus ether. If you listen to TakeOver, a lot of people say it was just facts and that's why it goes harder and stuff like that. But if you listen to Ether, you'll see that it's facts as well. A lot of what Nas said became true or was true. Nas on Ether said that Jay-Z took Biggie's rhymes. Jay-Z did spit a lot of the same lines Biggie spit. On top of that, Nas said that 
Jay Z is the type of person to apologize. Well, when Super Ugly came out a couple days later, he ended up apologizing. Nas also said that Jay Z is disrespectful towards women, and as we all know, when we heard Super Ugly, that was mad disrespectful to a woman. Now, Takeover had a lot of facts as well, but a lot of it was opinionated too. When Jay Z was talking about Nas delivering bad albums, he delivered one good album every 10 years. That's mainly an opinion, that's not a fact even though sales-wise could indicate that maybe it wasn't that great of an album. Plus, on TakeOver, Jay-Z isn't directly focused on Nas. When it comes to Ether, that whole track is dedicated to Jay-Z. On TakeOver, as we know, the first half is dedicated to Prodigy of Mob Deep, and then the second half is dedicated to Nas, because on that track, Jay-Z was basically responding to everyone that wanted problems with him. However, I do like TakeOver sonically more because of the production, and to me, it seems to have more replay value. I noticed while making this documentary, I ended up playing TakeOver more than Ether. But that's just my personal opinion. Plus, Nas's Ether track became a whole verb. When someone gets destroyed, whether it's in hip-hop or in anything in life, a lot of people say you got Ethered. They don't say you got takeover Also, during the battle, another slight towards Jay-Z was that Jay-Z put Memphis Blake in front of this battle just to test out Nas to see what he was going to do. That was sort of a weak move to me. I felt like Jay-Z should have just gone straight for Nas, even though he was the first one to publicly go at Nas. He should have just ended it right in the beginning of like 1999, right when things started to heat up. He should have just jumped into it and not have Memphis Bleak go back and forth with Nas. On top of that, another thing that slights Jay-Z in this battle was that the freestyles that he released going at Nas that were bad were swept under the rug, like those two tracks I mentioned before he released Super Ugly in December of 2001. Even Nas mentioned that, and that's a good point to make, that those freestyles were so bad that people don't even mention them. And if you release a bad freestyle during the midst of the battle, right when it's at its highest peak, that's definitely not a good look for you. So overall for the battle, I definitely give it to Nas. Even Jay-Z and Dame Dash at the time when they heard Ether, they were going crazy. They didn't know how to react to it. Jay-Z, when he did the interview with Andrew Martinez, acted very not confident anymore. And he just acted like he was thrown off by how good Nas responded to him. Plus, Jay-Z, of course, attacked Nas while Nas was dealing with his mother, you know, battling cancer, which is a serious thing. So Nas wasn't even focused and didn't even want to respond to Jay-Z at that time. Let's not forget that because he was more focused on taking care of his mother than actually going at it with Jay-Z. So while that was going on behind the scenes, he still managed to make Ether and just completely destroy Jay. Now let's talk about the war portion after the battle settled down who had the better career going forward. And I would give this one to Jay-Z simply because when Nas left Columbia Records, he decided to sign to Jeff Jam, and a lot of people saw that as Nas signing under Jay-Z after that battle, and that definitely wasn't a good look for Nas because Nas was looked at as a legend. Jay-Z, of course, is a legend too, but Nas's status is so high, why would he sign under a label that's run by his former enemy? So it just overall looked like a weak and confusing move. For Nas, of course, Nas might not look at it like that because Nas is a very uplifting person. He likes to uplift the artists. He doesn't like to start battles and beefs. Only when he gets poked is when he starts to go back and forth with people. But Nas likes to help other artists. And, you know, he doesn't look at it like, you know, not nah, Jay-Z is this and I'm this and I'm not supposed to be signing with him or helping him or doing any work with him. He looks at it as, you know, we're brothers teaming up to build something great which is a great outlook on things, but that's what the public views it as, and I can see why. Plus, moving forward, Jay-Z's music career has gone better and better and better as time went on. I'm not saying that Nas fell off completely, but his projects weren't as impactful as Jay-Z. Like when Jay-Z released the 444 album, everyone was talking about it. Everyone was talking about certain tracks, you know, lines that were going at newer artists. It was just a great hip-hop culture moment. Then when Nas dropped in 2018, his Nas album, it wasn't really received well, and it kind of came and went. The reviews were subpar on it. You know, it didn't really have an insane impact. It was the fact that it was attached to Kanye West that got it a little attention. But other than that, most people did not care. Plus, if we're looking at business-wise, Jay-Z has gone to a whole different level and is looked at as probably one of the greatest businessmen in hip-hop 
ever. And Nas in this field is doing amazing as well. He has a lot of investments and a lot of companies. And I made a video about eight months ago where he sold the ring investment that he had to Amazon for like $10 million or something like that. And he has great investments, great business ideas. It's just not out there in the public like Jay-Z. It's more low-key. So Nas is doing great in the business field as well. Just Jay-Z's impact in that has been way, way better. But that's it. That's my take on Nas versus Jay-Z, who won the battle and who won the war. That's it for this episode of Who Really Won. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. This definitely was one of the greatest hip-hop battles ever two icons going at it in their prime. So I had a lot of fun making this. So I hope you guys had a lot of fun watching it as well. With that being said, leave a comment below. Let me know on the episode you guys want me to work on next. If you want to support this channel further, you can do so at patreon.com backslash diverse mentality for just a dollar a month or more. You can help support this channel further. Like, comment, share, and definitely subscribe. I do videos like this daily on hip hop news and much more. So definitely subscribe. Follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at QuakeGW. Like us on Facebook, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.